Some time ago, I started working through Homer's Iliad, and especially uh, looking at the verbs and seeking to do a grammatical analysis. And what I'm using, the book I'm using, is basically called a classic interlinear translation of the Iliad of Homer. And uh, it's an interesting little book. It was published back in 1888 by Charles de Silver and Sons. Uh, it is also, I believe, available uh, in public domain on Google Books. And so if anyone wants to follow along, uh, that, would be, that would be great. Uh, basically, what I'm trying to do is work through slowly some of Homer in the Greek. Uh, my training, my first doctorate was in biblical studies and with an emphasis in New Testament Greek. And my PhD was in Hebrew and ancient Near Eastern languages. So I am not a classical scholar, but I want to learn at this point in life, I'm retired. I'm a retired uh, from the seminary. I was a seminary uh, chair professor. And now I'm doing this as a hobby for the fun of it. So anyone that's listening, please help me. If, you, if I make some mistakes, I'm, I'm open. I'm, I'm learning. Uh, I want to keep learning. The books that have helped me most are FAR, P-H-A-R-R, -R, and Bennett. Uh, B-E-N-N-E-T, Selections from Homer's Iliad. And uh, these are books have been a tremendous help to me in beginning to work through taking my coin A training and trying to begin to read Homer. Let me just say the importance of reading Homer, I think, has been highlighted by David uh, Henry David Thoreau, who basically lived from 1817 to 1862. And in his work, Walden, or Life in the Woods, he made a comment about Homer. He said the student may read Homer in the Greek without danger of dissipation or luxuriousness. Uh, he goes on to say, for it implies that he's going, the reader is going to spend time. Uh, he says, consecrate or consecrate morning hours to their pages. Well, I'm not a morning person, <laughs> but basically I'm excited about, as a hobby, doing this. My main emphasis has been biblical grammar of Greek and Hebrew. So this is a different kind of a challenge. He says, we must laboriously seek the meaning of each word and line. And I think that is true uh, as we study a language that is not spoken, such as the classical Greek of Homer. And he goes on to talk about how the adventurous student will always study classics. For what are the classics but the noblest recorded thoughts of man? And I think that is true. And he said, to read well, then, is to read books in a true spirit of their original author. And it requires a training such as the athletes underwent. And they need to be read as deliberately and reservedly as they were written. And uh, Thoreau here is talking about the importance of looking at every word grammatically when we're reading a work like Homer. And so what I'd like to do is to go through uh, the work that I'm using, and I appreciate the interlinear approach. It helps build vocabulary. Now, for somebody that's looking for Homer to be read in poetry, 
There are many, many videos out there that do that. My purpose is not that. My purpose is to look at the grammar and try to understand the grammar. And so I would go to those other videos for reading uh, Homer. Uh, so the interlinear, though, is a blessing to me. It uh, basically follows what is called the Hamiltonian methodology, where you have the Greek and then Inter, in an interlinear way, the English below it. So I wanted to just uh, pick up where I had left off. I thought it was interesting that John Milton made a statement that's quoted in uh, this uh, text. It says, we do amiss to spend seven or eight years merely in scraping together as much Latin and Greek as might be learn easily and delightfully in one year. And I'm finding this really uh, in teaching the Greek of the New Testament and the Hebrew of the Hebrew Bible. That is trying to help the student be able to, first of all, read the text slowly and pronounce each word followed then by a slow grammatical analysis. And again, I think the interlinear uh, does a wonderful job in doing that. So let me pick up where we're at. We're at, I believe, in uh, Homer, beginning at line 59, for anyone that might be following at this point. Let me just give the background there's other videos up to this point that we have put out. Uh, and I'm using Bennett here, or Binner, and uh, how he summarizes the units in a very wonderful way. He said, we begin with the muse being called to sing of Achilles' wrath, which brought sorrow and death to the Achaean uh, camp. This is on uh, page actually the first page of Bennett. He then goes on to outline the steps, how Chrysus, priest of Apollo, comes to the Achaeans uh, to ransom his daughter, but Agamemnon refuses. He has captured her as his prize, and he's refusing to give her up. Matter of fact, he harshly dismisses uh, the uh, priest who has come. And so the priest then begins to pray to Apollo to avenge him. And in answer to the prayer of Apollo, uh, Apollo sends deadly shafts through the uh, Greek camp. And people are dying of a plague. And so it's at that point that Achilles calls an assembly and proposes to appease the angry God uh, to find out what is going on. And so this is where basically I believe we stopped last time in the vi previous videos. And so we picked that up in line 59. And so let me just read Actually, in the text that I'm using, it's a little bit, it looks like it's line uh, 60, 67, I believe. If in, in, the, in the text that I'm using, the uh, interlinear text. But let me just read. It reads, Hage etoi e pon, kos, that is, he truly having said thus, ara kata etzeta de calcus, uh, he sat down and he begins to, uh, let, me just, let me just read on here, uh, find where I'm at. <laughs> uh, here we go. Uh, he sat down, he was sitting down, but calcus, son of Thester, arose. De calcus, Thestarides, 
Aneste, and to them by far uh, toy sin aka adastas oyonapalon, the best of the augurs. And so he's going to call that there should be a, uh, a priest or someone who would come and help out. And so we pick it up. I need to go back actually a few lines to, uh, to line 59. I jumped ahead. Uh, so let me go back to line 59. And this is where uh, I think really I stopped last time. So it reads, A trede noon a eo, O son of Atreus, now I think. Ame palim plak thentas apanastesen ups. That is, we having wandered back to be about to return back. And that is to return to home. Ame is the accusative plural uh, from ego. And so I'm thinking uh, we, which is the accusative plural, having wandered back. And here we have Palim plate thin tas. That is having wandered back. The root is plazo to wander back. And so we're looking here at a first aorist passive participle uh, accusative plural from the root plazo. So having wandered back uh, again to be about to return, uh, upon a stay sane, ups, to return back. And the root here is upon a steo, which means to return home. So being about to return home or return back, ege kin fugoimen thanatan. If at least, a yeah, would be if at least or indeed uh, we might escape death. Fu uh, goim fu goi men thanatan. Notice fu goi men is an optative, an aorist optative, uh, first person plural from fugo, that we might escape death. If or since truly, notice a de te palemas kai loimas hamu dama a kai us. If truly both um, war, palemas kai loimas and plague hamu together dame dama a kai us. If both together subdues the Achaeans. Notice here, uh, we, we begin with the aorist optative talking about escaping. If we would escape death, and then he moves on uh, to the future. Truly both war and plague together uh, will subdue us. And the form here in Dhamma is the future indicative active. Third, masculine, third person masculine singular from uh, Dhamma A. And actually, that comes from da, Dhamma Se. So, in other words, Dhamma Se. Then we have the ma -e and then the ma, which means future indicative active from the uh, ma se, from the mazo is the root. So together 
will pursue or will subdue. In other words, if truly both war and plague together will subdue the Achaeans, Achaeus. So in light of this uh, possibility of not making it back uh, from Troy, he then goes on to suggest that a priest or a prophet be called to help uh, appease the god Apollo. So it reads, Allah agade ere amen tena mantin. But come, truly, uh, let us ask. Notice Allah is the sh uh, sharp adversative here, but a conjunction. Aga is an imperative, and it means come, and it's used imperatively imper by, as an imperative throughout. So come now, ere amen, let us ask. Ere amen is from ereo, to ask, and here we have uh, a, like a cohortative. Uh, let us ask a cohortative, and then he goes on to say, let us ask tena mantin, some prophet, a rea, or a priest, a kai ane rapalan, or a dream interpreter. So let us ask <clears throat> either a prophet, and notice Montis here, or Montin, uh, comes from Montis, which means a prophet. Montis, I should say, meaning a prophet or a seer, or a Hearea, this is from Hearus, or a priest. And by the way, we have that in New Testament Greek as well. So let us come and ask some prophet or priest, a kai ane rapalan, or a dream interpreter, or one who interprets dreams. One of the things that they want to find out is why is Apollo angry, or Apollos angry. And then uh, it goes on, gar kai anar estin ek uh, dios. That is, uh, and or even the dream is from Jupiter. Notice here, or uh, from Apollo. Uh, the dream actually is controlled by the gods. They have to help us to understand. And we can go to a priest or a prophet to find that understanding as to why Apollo, I should say, why Apollo is upset. So as we read on, uh, let us ask some prophet or priest or dream interpreter for even kai aner estin ek dios. Even the dream is from Apollo. And uh, Apollo, again, is the one they're trying to appease and find out what's going on. Chas ke epoi, who may say. Apoi is the aorist optative third masculine singular from Lego. In other words, who might interpret what is happening? Why? Phoebus Apollo, who now boasts to be much most uh, much the most excellent of the Achaeans. So we need some sort of interpreter to help us understand what is going on and why this is happening. 
And so this is the context of what I read today. And let me just say, as I'm looking at this, it is true that in the biblical uh, texts, like Daniel and Joseph, the Lord has to interpret the dreams. And here in the Homeric text, it's, it's really uh, the, a prophet, or excuse me, a priest, or one that would find out and have it revealed to him why uh, Apollo is doing this. And we see this again in the Hebrew Bible, in Daniel being able to interpret dreams because the Lord gives him the answer to give to Nebuchadnezzar and the same with Joseph. So I'm going to stop there uh, and uh, just continue on uh, as I have time uh, working my way through the grammar. Thank you. Uh, I hope this helps somebody. I'm enjoying it. Thank you.